Hi, I'm Laura and I'm the producer and reporter who worked on this week's Five Live Investigates. If you're listening to this podcast, it's probably because you heard the episode and you want to hear a bit more. If you didn't hear it, our investigation this week was all about firefighters and their mental health. And we found out that a number of UK firefighters who'd been signed off on long-term sick leave because of psychological issues had gone up by a third in the last six years. During the course of the show, we heard from all sorts of firefighters, past and present. We heard from family of firefighters too. And the one thing that really struck me is how all of those firefighters have seen horrific things in the course of their day-to-day job. And it's stuff that most of us would never encounter, let alone see regularly. Whether it's house fires or car accidents, some of those things are bound to stay with them and bound to have a long-lasting effect. I want you to listen to a couple of the people I met. They're called Andy and John Graham, and they're a dad and son from Manchester. We'll hear from John a bit later, but first let me tell you a bit about Andy. He's 52 and he was in Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service for almost 30 years. He invited me into his house and he started by showing me the three helmets that kept him safe through his career. Yeah, so this is uh, my original cork helmet that was issued to me as a, as a young firefighter in uh, January 87. It's made of cork, it's painted with household gloss paint, and I used to go into burning buildings wearing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it, it served me well, and I have two other helmets which have served me just as well. This is my Pacific helmet. Uh, obviously, this, as you can see, this has got rank markings on it. Uh, oh, what, what years would you have been wearing that? The... the, the Cork helmet will have been through, through the uh, the late eighties into the early nineties. The the Pacific helmet um, will have been the uh, early nineties through to the uh, early noughties. Uh, and then there's the uh, the big one, which is the the Galley helmet, which served me right up then from the uh, the noughties through to when I left the service last year. And these are the helmets that kept you safe. Yeah, yeah. As you can see, they're uh, they're bashed, they're dented. uh, You know, as as I said, when you when you're in a burning building, it's full of smoke. Literally, you can't see past your nose. And if you haven't got something protecting your skull, you're going to get a bump or two. You know, so they 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 really have uh, kept kept me safe, and I'm uh, I'm going to keep them safe for the rest of my life. And it's one of the few things that my lad's going to inherit when he (laughs) when I eventually pop my clogs. So you can hear there that Andy's really proud of his time, more than half of his life that he spent in the fire service. He went on to show me three medals that he was awarded too for long service and good conduct. And meeting Andy, you just wouldn't know that he's been living with sometimes crippling mental health issues that were caused by the things he'd seen in his job. When he retired last year, it was because of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And as you'll hear, at times, it's taken him right to the brink. The first fatal incident that I attended uh, as, a, as a young uh, probationary firefighter was a suicide. Um, and this was a chap who was suffering mental health issues uh, due to the fact that he was uh, going through a, a divorce. His wife had left him and basically he, he manufactured a, a suicide belt for himself and blew himself up. Uh, we, we were there for uh, over 12 hours at that incident uh, and when we uh, knocked off the following morning I was uh, straight on to annual leave there was no debrief system in place I also at the time uh, with my first wife she was she felt unable to um, discuss these things with me so which meant I had no no way of talking about the things that were going on and within a matter of weeks I started suffering from nightmares and, and panic attacks and uh, it snowballed from there after attending more fatal incidents uh, including road traffic collisions and house fires and things and, and as I said back then there was no uh, proper debriefing system in place with the fire service at all. So what would happen after you'd been to a traumatic incident like that? Would there be any kind of support? Would your colleagues talk amongst themselves about what had happened? Under normal circumstances, if if, if you return back to station um, and there was time to sit down uh, and, and talk, then basically uh, that's what would happen. Guys would sit down, 
have a cup of tea, slice of toast or fire cake as we used to call it, and uh, and and talk about stuff. But it 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 wasn't really discussing. It was more a case of um, it was the black humour that that was used. You know, there the was no system. End of story. That that was it. It was it was all down to um, peer support. You know, the just being able to sit down and and uh, and have a laugh and a joke about things that 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 you shouldn't really be having a laugh and a joke about because it was we were seeing horrible things. Um, or you know, after 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 a day shift, maybe uh, if you've had a bad day shift, get getting down the pub and having a few beers with each other, and uh, and and on on occasion getting blind drunk. How did it affect you in daily life, um, seeing these traumatic things and, and coping with the stress of them? It was horrible. Um, say uh, I was. I was afraid to go to bed at night because of the nightmares, um, which meant I started staying up late. The wife was going off to bed all by herself and, getting, and being very lonely. Uh, I, I would sit up um, and have a, have a few beers or, or a few whiskies to try and uh, get me to the state where I, I, I would want to fall asleep. Um, through the uh, through the daytime, I would be avoiding going to certain places where, where certain things had happened. Um, you know, certain things would would set me off. You know, there would be triggers that would set set me off having flashbacks and, and, and panic attacks. Those triggers being blue lights, sirens, loud bangs, and seeing uh, certain situations being depicted on TV even would set me off. What did it feel like to have a flashback or, or a panic attack? What does it feel like well, when you're in the centre of that? The, the, the flashback is is uh, an intrusive memory, uh, and it's and it, and it comes on very very quickly when a trigger is present so and the strength of the, the, the flashback would depend on the strength of the trigger so with a really really powerful trigger uh, I, I, it would it'd be basically it'd be like being transported back in time uh, you you would be able to see see the things that you saw you'd be able to hear the things you heard you'd be able to smell the things that uh, that you smelled you know it, it, for all intents and purposes in your mind you, you were actually back in that traumatic situation there and then it wasn't a memory it, it, it felt like that was the, re- the reality at the time um, um, with it with a panic attack it's, it's, it's an overwhelming fear uh, you know a feeling of dread you know it's, uh, it's, it's like sometimes it's, it's like having a, a like having a heart attack you know you're getting the pins and needles you're getting sweating your mouth's dried up your stomach's churning you're getting pains in the chest palpitations uh, and, and, and and all you all you can think of is I want to get the hell out of here. You know, it's 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 not nice, and it's it's not nice for for you when you're suffering it, but it's also not nice for those that are around you uh, when they see it. I was going to ask you that. How did your PTSD affect your relationships? Um, it had a disastrous effect on my relationships. My first marriage went went down the tubes. Um, we both knew there was something wrong with me. Neither of us understood. What was what it, what it was that was wrong what wrong with me, and because we didn't I had no understanding, we had, we had no idea where we could, where to turn to to seek help, you know, um, and as as a result, it just put more and more and more pressure on the relationship and drew drew drove a huge wedge between the two of us, you know, it's it, it, it's um, it's not easy being someone that's living with a mental health health condition. But also, it, it it can't be very easy at all, loving someone that's living with a mental health issue because every time they suffer, you suffer as well. And if you if you've had no no support yourself, no no uh, training in in how to deal with these situations, how are you supposed to cope with 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 you know your partner, your loved one going through that? How are you supposed to help them? You know, um, the, the the feelings of um, of uh, Helplessness must be absolutely immense for 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 those that are around uh, and wanting to help but can't. And that included your children as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, um, that they, they they must have had a, a horrible time a lot of the time. Be it being being my children, because uh, I was um, you know such a, a, a moody person. You know, one minute I, I would be quite 
happy and, and, and sitting minding my own business and no problem at all and the next minute I'd be having a panic attack or I'd be I'd become very very angry and, and frustrated and, and and basically unbearable and un, you know not a nice person to be anywhere near how did your son John try to help you cope with that he um, he just excuse me well I just get a bit of a bit choked up he uh, he was only very young. Um, he's, he's he's never known me until now to be fully mentally well. You know, I was I was mentally ill before he was born. Um, but every time he saw me getting upset, every time he saw me get me angry, every time he saw me, me having a panic attack, he would be the one that uh, that came towards me as opposed to going away from me. Uh, and he would put his arms around me and give me a big cuddle and say, "Love you, daddy." You know, that's that's all he could do. You know, as 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 a child, for because he was only eight years old when his mother and I split up. So you know, it's, that that's uh, an incredible um, burden for for a child that uh, that age. But it's it's the one thing that uh, that kept me going. Uh, what what was the lowest moment for you? Where did you get to? Um, it was when when I had my breakdown in in ninety nine. Um, I'd had a, a particularly busy night at Stretford, rubbish fires all over Trafford Park, dragging hose all over the place. Um, the following morning, I uh, I felt a bit of a twinge in my back, so I knocked off at uh, going home time, and I went down to see my doctor, um, stepped into the doctor's room, and he said, what's up? And I opened my mouth to say I've got a bad back, and I just fell apart, just absolutely literally fell apart and I was I was basically a puddle on the floor well thankfully my GP is really really good uh, and he said right okay uh, I think we've got some serious issues here and we need to get you some help and um, back then there was no counsellors in our area um, there, was, there, was, there was no mental health services to speak of at all in, in our area so but but bless him he he searched high and low and found a CBT therapist that was willing to come and travel over to our area once a week to see me and she came over once a week for the best part of six months um, but uh, going through those uh, those, those, time when, those times when, it, when I was at my lowest I was suicidal and I was suicidal for a long time so uh, and you know, uh, if it wasn't for having um, my lad to to cling on to, the thought of um, uh, of what it would do to him, I, I would have carried it through. We'll come back to Andy a bit later, but first let's hear from his son, John. He's 24 now and has a young daughter. He's currently living with his dad in Carrington, near Man United's training ground. And John told me that his dad was always a hero in his eyes. I always remember myself having... Um, really good childhood uh, playing football in the park with my mates uh, normal school life going in, go, coming home with homework sitting down, being told I wasn't allowed to go out until it was done, tidying my room every time I got told to do it and I've always having a, a really close relationship with my dad really supportive, encouraging when I started playing football he was, he was there every weekend, he was stood at the side of the pitch come rain, snow or sunshine including training sessions every single time um, and he was always the loudest one there including the players he was shouting over the top of absolutely everyone that's all I ever remember hearing was was go on son or keep going um, and then if we scored a goal he's screaming and shouting And what about his job as a firefighter? How did you feel about the job that he did? Still have the same feelings he's a hero um, I have that same feeling for Every, whether it's armed forces or emergency services, every or even doctors, nurses, they're all heroes in my eyes. They go out, they risk their lives day in, day out to keep us safe. And being my dad, who is an even bigger hero, being able to tell your mates, my my dad's brave enough to go into a burning building just to save other people's lives. Right now, it gives me goosebumps, and it always has. I remember going going to school and he'd come into my class and used to go into my sister's class as well to do talks and he'd come in with his fire service gear on and I'd be able to nudge my mate beside me and go, it's my dad, he's a firefighter. And it was it was brilliant. I bet your mates thought that was really cool. Yeah, they did. 
say uh, they all got to go up and they all got to try on his his fire gear, whether it was the trousers or the tunic or the or even just the helmets or or boots. Um, occasionally, when I'll be playing on the park, it's randomly turn up with his crew in a fire in a, a fire engine. We'd all stop playing straight away because we got to go and sit in a fire engine. We got to go and see all the stuff that was attached to it and just just have a laugh and a joke with the firefighters that were there. And when you were um, a young boy, do you remember your dad having mental health problems? The only times I remember as a as a child was when I was really young, and I, I remember when he when he had his his breakdown. It's horrible to, to, to bring it back because being so young and coming through the front door and seeing your dad lying on the couch, someone that you're so used to being bubbly and happy and, and running around and playing football with you or just play fighting or whatever, and you come in and it, it doesn't even say hello to you. And he just sits there, a blank look on the face, like he's there in body but not in mind. And you just remember looking at him and thinking, in a way, is that my dad? It's it's hard to think of because in a way it 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 wasn't it was it wasn't my dad because he's going through these horrible things and the the person that he really is has been pushed back into a box in the back of his mind, so to speak, and these horrible thoughts are taken over and changed him and instinctively you see yourself as well he's not very well I need to make him better so the first thought that I had was the same thought that, that my parents gave to me when I wasn't well give me a cuddle didn't make me feel better that way make me feel safe so I wanted to do the same so the first thing I would do would be to go up and tell him I love him and to give him a big cuddle just to try and help bring that that person back, the person that he really is, back out. What's he told you since about how he felt at the time when you came up to him and you were the one giving him the cuddle? Um, he openly admits that if it if it wasn't for me, he wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for me and my sister at the time as well, he wouldn't be walking this planet anymore. Just that simple act of a child's love. Yeah, yeah. It's it's you can see it's a powerful thing, isn't it? It's, I know I've, I've I know it now. Having a daughter myself, if I'm feeling upset, just them, even not giving you a cuddle, just telling you to stop being silly. <laughs> it puts a smile on your face, seeing them smiling, and knowing that you're the reason that they're smiling. And as you got older, did you start to understand it a bit more, what he was going through? Yeah, um, he, he never he never spoke about it. Um, because whenever whenever we asked, he always said, I don't want to poison your mind because of the things that he'd been through. He felt that if he opened up and spoke about them, it would affect us mentally and it, we would end up in the same place that he was. And he wanted to protect us from it. So although it was hard, even growing up in the in my early teens and stuff, and seeing him having these episodes of anxiety and stuff, I still didn't understand them. But I knew sort of what was ha- what was happening. It could vary, vary from just not talking, not talking to anyone, or having a pretty short temper, if you like. Um, the slightest little things he would snap and you would hear him shouting and the rest of Carrington would hear him shouting as well <laughs> you know in, over the years he's he sort of developed a, a foghorn like mouth when he's when he's shouting so we, with, with it happening a few times you sort of understand and you know when it's coming and you think oh, I'll just take myself away and let's let's not have that sort of confrontation because of that's not, a want, not what I want with my, with my dad or or anyone for that, that matter. Did it affect his sleep as well? Yeah, it did. I, I do remember on a few occasions sleep, it had been fast asleep myself across the landing and you would hear him screaming or you would hear him shouting and swearing and you'd, you'd think someone had broken into the house. 
because it was that type of um, screeching and screaming of fear, and it is, it's, it was it was terrifying, and he he wouldn't remember it in the morning. He'd come downstairs and whether it was me or or my stepmom would say, "Do you remember screaming that last night?" And he'd go, "No," which which makes it even more concerning. You know, so if he can't remember it, he doesn't know it's happened. You must have a real understanding of um, mental health and, a, and an appreciation for how important mental health is and, and how it's important to to ask for help when you're in a bad situation. Yeah, um, more so now than ever um, because I've suffered sort of serious, stressful um, situations myself where obviously it's not on any level of what my dad has been through but it's, but it's put me in some some really dark places which I, I'm, I'm thankfully out of as well um, but yeah it's you can see it out in the streets with with some people you can see it with close friends you sort of start to notice little things here and there and you think you know something you might need to talk to someone or you, you need to go to the doctors no matter how close you can sit in a in a in a cafe somewhere and you could put your eyes on someone and think they're in a bad place um it was the same same with some some firefighters before my dad left the the, the, the service you go into the, the staff room and you'd see some of them some of them would be laughing and joking and you'd hear the dark humor coming from them and you think that's their coping mechanism and then you'd look across the dining hall and you'd see one of them face buried into a brew not talking to anyone so in a way, such a, a horrible sort of illness that my dad's went through has helped me in being able to identify myself as a person and others that are close by me. And I've been able to help them, thankfully, get get them to be where they need to be as well. So that was John, and you can hear there that he's learned a really valuable lesson from what his dad's been through and he can spot when people are struggling, people that perhaps the rest of us would miss. As for Andy, he's now a mental health first aider and trains other people in that. He also runs a charity for ex-emergency services and armed forces in his local area. I'm in a place now that I, I haven't been in, in over 29 years. You know, I'm in a place where um, I can recognise that... that I am an emotional being and, and I could actually deal with that um, and I'm in a place as well now where when those triggers appear I don't have the flashbacks, I don't have the, the, the intense emotional response that I used to have, I don't have the panic attacks um, uh, and, and that's been a long long hard battle I mean I've been in therapy um, four times now uh, three of those times were, were, were long periods of uh, cognitive behaviour therapy, CBT, which, um, while it hasn't sorted my problem out, I've, I've managed to pick up the odd tool here and there, which has helped, helped to keep me going until he eventually got the right treatment for me, which was EMDR treatment. EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitisation and Reprogramming. Uh, and it's a, it's a relatively new therapy, but it's it's proving very very effective in in treating people with uh, with post traumatic stress disorder, and it's made a huge difference to me, you know. And so until this time, John's never known me to be um, properly mentally fit and well. Um, neither has my wife, uh, <laughs> or my daughter, or, or you know a lot of my family, and and. All of them have noticed a, a huge change in, in me, and uh, and and that in in turn has had a as a positive effect on 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 them as well. And what advice would you give someone who's either just joined the fire service in the last couple of years, or or is thinking about a career as a firefighter? What would you say to them? I would say it's it's still the best job in the world. You know, um, the the level of camaraderie that you get. While, while you're on your watch is second to none 
when you get out there and, and you do a, a good job and it goes well and you manage to save a life the the immense feeling of uh, of pride that you get from that is is unbelievable you know but at the same time i would say you need to be realistic and you need to prepare yourself for the fact that sometimes things don't go so well sometimes you, you you're going to experience things that no human being should ever experience um, and you need to to be prepared to ask for help and support when it's needed, and, and in doing that, we need to we need to change the the whole culture of uh, of, of the emergency services from top to bottom, at all levels and in all departments. Because you know some people are, are, are really good at providing support, and, and others are just not. You know, so we need to get to a point where everybody starts thinking about mental health seriously and in a positive way get rid of that stigma so that when somebody does need help we're able to provide it. That was Andy and John a dad and son's story about the impact of experiencing trauma at work. For more on that story including what's being done to support firefighters you can listen to the full episode on our website. To hear more Five Live podcasts you can subscribe in your usual place.